Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome from Delhi to Last Minute Ophthalmology to all my students across the country and across the world, actually. And we call it Last Minute Ophthalmology. Why? Well, it's still not the last minute because we are essentially aiming for my students, which we have been discussing ophthalmology for the December 12th exam. I say discussing because I don't teach. I wouldn't dare to teach you. I wouldn't presume to teach you. Okay. But we discuss it, so it's a discussion. So we are going to talk about some questions. Remember, we have all studied ophthalmology for the past six months or whatever. But in the last minute, it is not the revision again and again, which you do again and again and again, which is important. It's about able to solve questions. And by solving MCQs, we do a lot of active learning. You see, you can write it down three, four times. Many of you are addicted to highlighting the answers. In fact, you highlight the answers so much that the areas that you've not highlighted have become highlighted. That is not the way. You have to extract the information out of the question. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start without wasting any further time. We don't have too much time. Time is always ticking away. And this is a live session. So, please ask me your questions and uh, I will try to answer them as I can. So, sometimes for shortage of time, I just rush on. So, here it is, your last minute ophthalmology presented by your friendly neighborhood ophthalmologist. Today. And this is what we're going to do. And ladies and gentlemen, look at that. This is the <coughs> topic we're going to do. The lovely, lovely skull. So, here comes the first question. Let's look at that. All of them are seen in primary, primary congenital glaucoma, which is Bufthalmos except so again it begins with except so remember we have three of them which are correct and so remember buphthalmos is congenital glaucoma which means the child is eyeball is too large it's called buphthalmos because the eyeball is large like a bullseye or a cow's eye okay so vogue's try corneal edema myopia and optic disc cupping okay so these are the four things we have so we have to say which is not present here so you know it's a large eye so it's going to be myopic, okay? You know, there will be optic disc cupping because it's raised intraocular pressure. And there will be conodema because the raised intraocular pressure, it forces the aqueous into the cornea, you'll have conodema. But Vogue's trial, ladies and gentlemen, will not be there. Because Vogue's try is seen not in Bufthalmos, but in keratoconus. See, the stri are there. Stri means folds. You have to be careful. Vogue's is seen in keratoconus. And this is in Habs trial. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. See, this is the Bufthalmos. We see the large eyeball, easily diagnosed because the other eye is normal, but it's a large size and it's a large size eyeball and it's hazy because of the edema, is it not? And because of the stretching of the eyeball, because remember it's congenital glaucoma, so up till birth, from birth till three years of age, the eyeball can stretch, and as it stretches, as it stretches, it becomes it becomes something like this. Okay. So, see, this is what it is. Let me just draw it for you. So, see, you know the normal axial length of the eyeball is like this. So, when you have the rays of light focusing on the retina. But up till three years of age, the sclera is ex very, very expensile with stretches. So, as it stretches, remember, the retina will come here and the patient becomes myopic because the eyeball is too large. Okay. So, both talmic patients do develop myopia, which is what you see here. So we have this choice here. So you have the conidium you can see, large eyeball you can see, and myopia you will see, optic cupping. But Vogue's trial, gentlemen, is not there because seen keratoconus. What we have instead is Hab's try. Again, there's try, but look at these. These are ruptures of the Desmet's membrane because of raised intraocular pressure. The Desmet's membrane is inelastic and not cannot stretch. It cannot stretch, so develop these ruptures of folds in the Desmet's membrane. Okay. So Hab's try is present in Bufthalmos. Vogue's try is parent is keratoconus. Very well. Next question is which type of senile cataract is notorious for causing glaucoma? And look at that. So that's a proper question which you like to ask you. Senile cataracts notorious for causing glaucoma is incipient choices, immature, and intumescent, and nuclear cataracts. So, you know, glaucoma. Now we are talking about cataract causing glaucoma. So these are two important topics clashing. How does a cataract cause glaucoma? by swelling up and forcing the iris forward and blocking the angle is not so suppose we take the same diagram and suppose we have this is the normal patient okay normally this is the lens and we have the iris here like this let me erase this thing so you have this normal lens and see what happens how does a cat so you have a cataract 
So this is opaque and it blocks light. So now how does this cause glaucoma? It causes glaucoma by become solar libelous. How does it swell up? Because it's in tumors and it attracts this water from the aqueous humor. These are usually mature cataracts, but they can rarely be immature cataracts, or rarely, but usually mature cataracts which draw this water from the aqueous humor get swollen and see as they become swollen, they push the iris forward and block the angle, causing an angle closure glaucoma. So this is the cataract which causes glaucoma because it's intumescent. Remember the word intumescent means swollen up. And it is intumescent cataract which causes the maximum glaucoma, which you can see here. Look at that. It's a mature cataract. How? Because it's completely white and no rays can pass through. Mature cataracts absorb a lot of water. They swell up and as they push the iris forward, I'm blocking the angle, this leads to an acute angle closure glaucoma. So please remember the only difference between an acute angle closure glaucoma and a phacomorphic glaucoma, which we call a phacomorphic, phaco lens and morphic. The only difference between them is that the mature cataract is there in phacomorphic glaucoma. In acute angle closure glaucoma, there is no cataract. So when you have the word cataract in glaucoma, it means you're talking about phacomorphic or phacolytic. In a normal acute angle closure glaucoma, there will be no lens pushing the iris forward. In that case, the angle is again getting blocked but this time by the pupillary block action, by the mid dilating pupil causing pupillary block leading to angle closure block. Okay, so this is an intumescent catalyst. Gentlemen, I expect you all to answer these questions when we ask them. So far, so good. If you haven't done it, please ask me and I'll get back to you in a certain while. Very well. So we've got an intumescent catalyst. What's the next question? The next question says a 45 year old colored man. Okay, colored man, that's a clue here. Remember. Of course, there is a red herring also. We try to draw you away from what we are trying to ask you. A colored man, remember colored people are our friends from Africa. This is the people who are stay in Africa and there is a reason why we ask them. Presents with a post-traumatic hyphema. That means blood in the anti. You get hit in the eye, get blood in the antechamber. All of them are correct management steps except dear me. Let's look at what the harvest is. Topical steroids, okay. Cyclopagic eye drops, okay. Carbon anhydrase inhibitors, well, all right, and head end elevation. So, what happens? What they're asking is that when you get hit in the eye, as by an accident or personal violence or an, any interpersonal violence, then you have a high fever. What is that? Blood in the anterior chamber. So, that looks this a high fever. So, this is blood. So, you've had a high fever. So, what are the management techniques here, except one of them is wrong? What is that? Let's start with the bottom. Head end elevation, yes, we do that. We do head end elevation. We ask these patients to lie with a couple of pillows under the neck so that the head is elevated and the foot is down. This helps the blood to settle down because of gravity and clears the visual axis, okay? Because if the patient lies flat like this, then it will, if the high femur is covering up the mid pupil, you will not be able to see. When you lie like this, so by gravity, the blood drains down and clears the visual axis. This does help, that's correct. A cyclopagic eye drop like homotropine or liatropine definitely helps because it releases the ciliary spasm. You see, because the blood is inside the antechamber, it will cause uveitis. This blood is irritant, it causes a lot of uveitis and we would like to reduce the ciliary spasm by giving cyclopagic. This is also acceptable. Topical steroids, yes, definitely because uveitis, remember, the blood inside the antechamber is causing uveitis. You need topical steroids for that. What is more in doubt is the CAI inhibitors, carbonic anise inhibitors, but why? You know that Hyphema is well known to cause glaucoma. Traumatic hyphema, particularly, traumatic hyphema, but leads to a lot of glaucoma. So I need an anti-glaucoma drug. So why would this be in doubt? Because you see, it's a CAI inhibitor, which is definitely difficult to be used in a person of the colored races. Our friends from Africa, they are well known to have the sickle cell disease, remember? And carbonic anise inhibitors causes a lot of sickling. So this is a very important rule that whenever we have patients from Africa or our friends with darker skins, then we prefer not to give them CI inhibitors. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like this. There is some problem here which we need to iron out, which we need to, okay. So please remember, what is happening is, we have the CAI inhibitors, particularly acetazolamide, which is the systemic thing. Acetazolamide, which is well known for inducing sickling. Why? Because acetazolamide, remember, it causes metabolic acidosis, isn't it? We know that. 
metabolic acidosis and metabolic acidosis would induce sickling okay and how does it induce metabolism well that's well known because you know, these are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors so what they do remember they inhibit so what do they inhibit say they inhibit the reabsorption of the bicarbonate ion okay remember carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are called because they inhibit the reabsorption inhibit the reabsorption of the bicarbonate ion from the renal tubules and when you do not reabsorb the bicarbonate ion then it causes acidosis and this acidosis may induce sickling of the red blood cells so please remember sickle cell anemia sickle cell anemia is predominantly seen in the colored races that is why in any patient from the colored races we would avoid carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because remember they again to get to the root ci inhibitors may cause metabolic acidosis metabolic acidosis would induce sickling and this might induce a sickle cell crisis in a patient from africa so that is why this is a very important rule of th thumb that we always avoid ci inhibitors we always avoid ci inhibitors in the <coughs> patient with the dark skin okay very well so that's an important question for you and let's go to the next one the next one is going to be a patient presents with a fixed dilated pupil not reacting to light dear me that sounds serious not reacting to light on pilocarp installation the pupil does not constrict even more dangerous pilocarp is a powerful constrictor why is not constricting what is the probable diagnosis let's take a look at that it's a good question it's a third nerve palsy. It's possible because you remember third nerve paralysis, you have a pupil dilated. Uncle herniation. Yes, the uncus often herniates. And they lead to a very famously dilated pupil called the blown pupil. It's dilated so much, it's called a blown pupil. Pharmacological blockage means that some pharmacological drug has been given, which is blocking, like atropine or homotropine or cyclopentylate or AD's pupil. AD's pupil is pupil dilated. Now remember all of these four are very good answers because all of them have a dilated pupil. So they have come to this fixed dilated pupil, not react to light. On pilocarp installation the pupil does not constrict. Okay. So the answer, let's work it out, look at that. This is a dilated pupil and the patient comes to you, we put a drop of pilocarp which does not constrict. If it does not constrict then we can safely say it cannot be AD's pupil because remember AD's pupil we have this that we, when you put pilocarp in, people can see immediately, is it not? Remember ADs, that was the test. If you remember, with an ADs pupil, we have something like this. A patient comes to us with one pupil dilated, the other normal. We put pilocarp in 0.125%, which is about one eighth of a percentage. Very dilute pupil. So we need to put a diluted pilocarp in, in both eyes. The normal pupil does not constrict but the abnormal pupil constricts. And this is the sign of ADS pupil. Why is that doing that? Because why is the normal pupil not constricting with pilocarpine? Because it's too dilute. It's 0.125, it's just too dilute. It cannot constrict this pupil. But even this dilute pilocarpine is able to constrict the ADS pupil because of denervation supersensitivity. Remember, in ADS, what has happened is that the nerve is damaged, so it is super sensitive to even very dilute solutions of pilocarpine, which is 0.125%. So this question definitely eliminates AD's pupil because not reacting to pilocarpine. Now what about third nerve palsy? Remember the uncle herniation with the pupil also dilates is the same thing because of raised intracranial pressure paralyzing the third nerve. The third nerve has the parasympathetics. You know that the third nerve carries the parasympathetics or not. You all know why third nerve palsy causes pupil dilatation. See this is the third nerve and on the surface of the third, third nerve carries two different kinds of fibers we all know that one in the center which are the somatic fibers somatic fibers means that these fibers supply the motor nerve supply which is remember the six muscles the superior, superior rectus the inferior rectus the middle rectus the inferior oblique and the LP. So, you know, these are the five muscles which are supplied by the third nerve and only the lateral rectus is by the sixth nerve and the superior oblique is by the fourth nerve, is it not? So we have the one, two, three, four, five muscles. So the somatic fibers, let me use this pink color, lie in the center. But in the periphery, let me use the magenta, in the periphery here, 
lie the parasympathetic fibers. The parasympathetic fibers travel to the eye via the third nerve and the sympathetics travel to the eye via the fifth nerve. So when you have damage to the parasympathetic fibers which are passing through the third nerve, so they cannot constrict because the parasympathetics are for constriction. So they cannot constrict, so the unopposed sympathetic, the unopposed sympathetic fibers dilate the pupil. That is why third nerve paralysis lands up with the pupil dilated pupil. Now see what happens. If you put pilocarpy in such a third nerve paralysis, it will constrict. Why? Because see, let's look at physiology. In physiology, suppose this is the motor nerve and this is the axon end like this. And this is the synaptic cleft and across this are the synaptic cleft. This is the receptor. So what happens when an action, but this is not physiology, can you remember? Often model is a lot of physiology in it. So when there's an action potential comes here, what it does, it releases the acetylcholine here, okay? This acetylcholine in these bags here. This acetylcholine swims across the synaptic cleft, goes to the receptors, let's make them in red, the other receptors. And as this swims across the cleft, goes to the receptors, and they bind to the receptors, and they cause the action potential. Now, in third nerve palsy, because the third nerve is paralyzed, so there is no action potential occurring here. So there is nothing to release the acetylcholine and they are not swimming across synaptic cleft. So what I have done, I have put pilocarpine. I have put pilocarpine, remember pilocarpine will stimulate acetylcholine to, to swim across synaptic cleft, go to the receptors and it will act because the receptors are there waiting for the acetylcholine and it will cause pupil constriction. So in third nerve palsy, as well as in uncle herliation, which is the basically dilates the pupil by the same th mechanism, by putting pilocarpine, we would cause acetylcholine to be released and they would go to the receptors and initiate the pupillary constriction. But in pharmacological blockade, which is like atropine or homotropin cyclopentylate, even if I put pilocarpine, they would release the acetylcholine. But remember, there is there is blockade here. The receptors are blocked by the drug, which is atropine or homotropine. So the receptors cannot, cannot accept the request of the acetylcholine and they will not consider the people because the receptors are already blocked by the drug. So it's drug blocked by the drug. That is why in pharmacological blockade, as by atropine or homotropine, the people will not constrict. The rest of them, they will all constrict. And that is the answer here. It's pharmacological blockade. Okay, so that's a very good question. So please remember, a lot of time patients come to us, you know, with blurring of vision and the pupil dilated. And we just ask them, have you been exposed to any particular drug like atropine, homotropine? Most often, they are lab accidents and it happens. Very well. So next question is going to be, conjunctival congestion is characterized by all except. So when the conjunctiva becomes inflamed, let's see the things that are characteristic of the brighted color. You have a mobile blood vessels. You have no blanching by phenylephrine and individual vessels can be distinguished. Now let's look at that. See, this is the congestion, congestion, congestion. As you can see the blood vessels here, it's a bright red color, which is correct, which is correct. Movable blood vessels, it is also correct because you see, you can move the conjunctiva and as you move the conjunctiva, the blood vessels move with it, okay? Because the blood vessels are on the same level as the conjunctiva. Then the next one is individual vessels can be distinguished and you can see that that is true. They can be clearly seen, individuals can be distinguished. What is not true, and that is the answer is this one here, not blanched by phenylephrine. You see, that is the hallmark of conjunctival vessels that we, when we put phenylephrine drops, it immediately blanches the blood vessel. It becomes white. So uh, suppose I want to distinguish between whether this conjunction of the conjunctiva or of the sclera, we often put phenylephrine drops because you see, they are the same, they look the same. So when we put these phenylephrine drops, if it's conjunctival or even episcleral inflammation, the blood vessels would constrict and the sclera would become white, okay? This tells us that it's a conjunctival or an episcleral in episcleritis inflammation. But if it's a scleritis, vessels deep under the sclera, then the phenylephrine will not blanch them. It will not blanch them just because the scleral inflammation is just too deep. Isn't it? So this is the answer. It is also blanched by phenylephrine and it is incorrect. As you can see, you see, this is conjunctival inflammation. In scleritis, the inflammation is a violaceous blue. It's a violet blue. Look at that. Can you see? It's not bright red color like this. 
this is a definite violet colored thing why why so because the deeper vessels they appear violet colored particularly in bright sunlight okay they are not so well visualized under the slit lamp but in bright sunlight you will see this peculiar bluish tinge to it and if you put phenylephrine drops to it it would not constrict the vessel if not constrict because they are just too deep to be constricted but chondral vessels within a few seconds it will become white because phenylephrine would constrict the vessels and become white but this would become remain like this even with phenylephrine so answer ladies and gentlemen is going to be it is not blanched phenylephrine it is very definitely blanched by phenylephrine very well the next question is going to be a recurrent conjunctivitis occurring with the onset of hot weather in young boys with symptoms of itching burning and lacrimation is most likely due to so see the clues are here okay onset of hot weather that is a very important clue young boys okay occurs in children symptoms of itching burning and lacrimation i think you've got most of them you've understood this let's look at your trachoma mucoproteal conjunctivitis frictional conjunctivitis and vernal catarrh and the answer ladies and gentlemen is vernal catarrh also called vkc vernal keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis also called a spring catarrh which is mistaken because it's hot weather in warm weather and this typically in india is from april to october the hottest months of the year from april to october where these kids come to us itching their eyes all the time usually boys mostly okay and this is the most irritating thing often called morning misery it's called itching burning and symptoms and this is the vernal catarrh okay and up is typically the famous cobblestone papillae as you can see flat stones giant stone flat topped papillae which are a sign of allergy so this is often called as cobblestone papillae the answer is very clear it's going to be vernal catarrh it is not mucoproteal conjunctivitis the hot weather is got nothing to do mucoproteal and trachoma of course the weather is not important here very well so that was an easy one that was if you haven't got it please check your notes back again this is clearly mentioned there very well all are seen in pathological myopia dear me this is pathological myopia which means the eyeball is very large and a temporal crescent a foster fuchs spot do not confuse us with the dillon fuchs spot a pustiestophyloma and antistophyloma okay so now let's look at that see the pathological myopia remember the eyeball is longer it's myopic so normal there's simple myopia this pathological myopia pathological myopia begins with an eyeball which starts with almost growth of 26.5 mm okay normally axial length is about 24 this is about 26.5 and rapidly grows rapidly grows and it is characterized by certain changes in the posterior part of the fundus okay please remember simple myopia also eyeball is longer but it does not have this characteristic changes that are seen in pathological myopia so what are they and let's look at that this is the foster fuchs spot as you can see that look at that the foster fuchs spot is a macular hemorrhage kind of a thing which loses vision immediately because of the rapid stretching of the eyeball causes pulling of the blood vessels the rupture there's hemorrhage on the macula this is called as foster fuchs spot so this is seen in pathological myopia temporal crescent yes there is a crescent on the temporal side often seen it is not visible here or dm you can see on the disc you can see this is an annular crescent actually covering the entire disc but it can be annular or it can be temporal crescent this is also a consequence of the pulling of the sclera and one more is a posterior stephyloma also seen pathological myopia posterior posterior stephylomas remember are occurring because of the stretching of the eyeball you see what happens a stephyloma remember the word stephyl comes from grapes is not so in an eyeball in an eyeball when you have stretching of the retina if this is a normal eyeball so because of the massive stretching of the eyeball so what happens the posterior part of the sclera it develops this out pouching okay it becomes like this and develops this out pouching like this just because of the scleral thinning when the i there's so much growth of the eyeball the sclera becomes thinned and because of the thinning so this sclera posteriorly it pouches out like this this out pouching of the sclera is called as stephyloma and this leads to the retina remember the retina which is here this retina often dips into this and this is the stephyloma okay so the retina should normally have been like this is not but because of the out pouching of the sclera the retina also dips like this thin retina and this is what we see is posterior stephyloma it immediately causes a loss of vision and you can see that here look at that you can see clearly 
this is the disc and this is an excavation of the retina because of the out part of the sclera which is the posterior staphyloma very well so this is also seen but anterior staphylomas are not seen in matter anterior staphyloma are again out pouching of the sclera or the cornea but it occurs the anterior part of the eyeball so you will see suppose this is the cornea sclera like this and this is the posterior part so you will see that in this case it will the cornea or the sclera again because of thinning it pouches out and usually the iris is incarcerated in it, the iris is included in it, okay. So, anterior staphyloma is a condition where in the anterior part of the eye, there is an outpouching of either the cornea or the sclera, which is called ectasia, outpouching, because of thinning of the sclera of the cornea, which includes the uvea, which means the iris most of the time or the ciliary body sometimes. And this is anterior staphyloma, as you can see what has happened, this is the cornea here, it's ending here, but close to the limbus you have this area you can clearly see the the sclera is ectatic with a area of the iris and ciliary bodies included in this out pouching this is called antistophyloma this can be seen after trauma after corneal ulcers after glaucoma this is anterior staphyloma out pouching of the cornea or the sclera with the uveal tissue incarcerated inside this is not seen in pathological myopia Okay, this is only seen, let's say, in perfect corneal ulcers or bufthalmos or post trauma. So the answer here becomes anterior staphylum. <coughs> Very well. The next question is going to be a 55 year old lady with uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, remember, presents with gradual painless blurring of vision. So gradually, slowly loss of vision. And <coughs> on exam, she has NPDR. She had stage of non proliferative diabetes. You all know that we have two stages. The first, few years of diabetes is non-proliferative diabetinopathy and then after around 15-20 years it moves into PDR, is it not? So what is the best course of treatment? So the best course of treatment can only be decided when you know what is the cause of loss of vision in PDR, okay? So let's look at the choices we have. We have vitrectomy, we intravitreal triamcin alone which is steroid injection, which is topical, non steroidal and anti drugs and injection of bevacizumab which is an anti of drugs. Now remember, for this, we need to know first what is the cause of loss of vision. Remember, the patient has come to see me. Uh, it is a diabetic patient, he has come to me. Why has he come to me? Because I'm very beautiful. That is not the answer. He has not come to me because of my cosmetic charms. He has come to meet me because he has loss of vision. So what is the most common cause of loss of vision in NPDR? Remember, it is macular edema. We all know, or you should know, that the commonest overall cause of loss of vision in diabetinopathy is macular edema. So he has macular edema and that seems to be correct because remember, it's a gradually painless blurring of vision. If it is in sudden, we would think of vitreous hemorrhage, okay, or retinal detachment, but it is not sudden, it is slow, so it is macular edema. So what is the best treatment of macular edema? The best course of treatment is we give injection bevacizumab. anti of drugs is nowadays the first rule, the first thing we do is an injection anti of bevacizumab or ranibizumab as you know, given intravitrally through the pars plana and the vitreous cavity. This is number one treatment. We do that, but we can also do focal laser treatment and we can do also give triamcinol. Remember, steroids often help in macular edema, but the first choice is not steroids because they may cause glaucoma and they may also lead to cataracts. So once, first we try bevacizumab, which I mentioned here, to heal the macular edema. If this doesn't work, we can try the intravitreal triamcinol alone. But we have to be careful that patient should not be fake. That means should not have a normal lens because injecting the steroid or triamcinolone means that they would develop cataracts very fast. Answer here is D, injection bevacizumab. So this has two steps. First, you have to diagnose the condition. Once you diagnose the condition, you have to think of the treatment. Very well. So what's next? The works next is a 65-year-old patient presents after two months of cataract surgery with blurring of vision, which is haze and hypopion. Okay, that doesn't sound too good at all to me. White plaques were present on the surface of the implanted eye well. Now that is the hallmark of the spittle condition, white plaques. And what is that? What is the vitreous aspirate likely to show? See, since uh, it's a vitreous haze with a hypopion, with blurring of vision, so this means it is most likely an endophthalmitis. And since it is coming after two months, so it comes in late onset endophthalmitis. Remember, there are two. The early onset is usually within six weeks of cataract surgery. Late onset is after six weeks, okay? So this is a late onset endophthalmitis. Why? The vitreous haze tells us, loss of vision tells us, and the hypopion tells us. 
Now the characteristic thing is the white plaques on the implanted eye wells. So your choices are Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staph abdermidis, and Propionium bacterium acnes. And the answer here, ladies and gentlemen, is obviously Propionium bacterium acnes, as mentioned by the white plaques. Look at that. This is a hallmark of Propionium bacterium acnes, which usually is the most common cause of endothelmitis in late onset. You all remember, early onset the most common is Staph epidermidis followed by Staph aureus, is not Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. Number one is epidermidis, number two is aureus. But if it is late onset, it is caused by Propionium bacterium. And this typically plaques you see on the IOL is the hallmark of Propionium bacterium acnes. Okay, so the answer is P. acnes endothelmitis. Very well. So far, well done. Now identify the investigation for which the printout is provided. Okay, we have this printout here, and I hope that most of you will get this. So let us see what are the choices given. We have this corneal topography, which is used for various disorders for cornea like keratoconus, visual field for as in glaucoma, B scan ultrasonography, as in various retinal disorders and posterior segment disorders and optical cornea tomography, OCT, which is for retina. So we have this important investigation here, and this is very important, so let's take another look at it. This printout is clearly, if you do not know, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, so you should be able to identify this, because this is a visual field printout, okay? It's a visual field, so this is a patient of glaucoma, whom we suspect in glaucoma, maybe because of raising intraocular pressure, or maybe because of his optic disc cupping, okay? So we have done a visual field, and you can see clearly one, there's a left eye, so there's a left blind spot, Okay. And this is normal, but the right eye is not normal at all because there is a clear cut scotoma here. Okay, so this is could be there is a pathology here, it could be anything, but this is what we what we are not what the diagnosis we are not going to discuss now. But we have to answer that this is a clear visual field. And I want you to remember this is how it looks like because this will be asked in the exam, can be asked in the exam. Okay, we have these various modalities. Can you remember that these questions may seem to you a little difficult, but that is what paper is going to be, or we expect to be slightly more difficult as it approaches the next pattern in 23. So we have the answer here is visual field, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please ask me. And as and when I get these questions, I'll try to answer them. So let me see if we have uh, got any questions so far. So, my friends, hi to all of you. I'm so sorry that I'm not able to answer, I mean, say hi to all of you. But uh, we are just, we haven't got any questions so far as I can make out. But so far, so good. Please ask me as you, the thing. You have to be clear. Remember, after all, is not about memory work. Memory will fail you in the exam. Memory, notoriously unreliable. It's about understanding and working out. Very well. What's next? What is the treatment of choice for this condition? So first of all, we see this conjunctival overriding the cornea in the shape of a triangle or a bird's wing. So we know this is a pterygium. It's a pterygium. Word comes from bird's wing. Okay, bird's wing. This is conjunctival overriding the cornea here. And so what is the treatment? So we need to know. This was asked a couple of months back, I think, on the last exam. Excision with bare sclera, which seems to be good because we excise it and leave the sclera, sclera bare, that seems to be good treatment. What about it? Beta irradiation, this is also on the treatments. We bombard with some beta rays, and that is a, the, it's the pterygium. Excision with amniotic membrane transplantation, so we take it off and place amniotic membrane over this. And the fourth one we have is excision with conjunctival autograft. What is that? Autograft means that we first shave it off, of course, shave it off like this, and then from the opposite eye, from the other eye, we take a bit of conjunctiva and place it here. Autograft means from the same eye, from the same patient, okay? So this reduces the chance of rejection. So take a small piece of conjunctiva from this eye and place it over this particular area that you have removed. So this is the meaning of conjunctival autograft. So we have these choices and the answer, ladies and gentlemen, you have to know this because it was asked in the last exam, is conjunctival autograft, D. All of them are correct answers, but this is the best you see. The problem with this condition is the massive rate of recurrence, you know. Conjunctive, this pterygium, the moment we take it out, comes back again. It has almost a 70% rate of recurrence. And each time it comes back, it's thicker and redder and more fleshier. Okay, so it's more difficult. So remember, your best chance of getting rid of a pterygium is the first surgery. Because if it comes back second time and you operate, the chances that it will come back third time are higher, it will be worse. And it will be thicker and redder and more 
unsightly. And the more the number of times it comes back, the more difficult it is to get it away and the higher the chance of recurrence. So kindly remember, your best chance is to get it off in one shot. And the best answer is to cover it with the conjunctival autograph, take a bit of conjunctival from the opposite eye and small bit of course and place it here and suture it there. That is the best answer because this is, has the least rate of recurrence. It may still recur but it is the least. So let us look at that. See this is a pterygium here, you can see it here, it is the smallest pterygium, it has been taken out and, and you have placed, we have placed, let me show you the post-op, conjunctival autograph and you see it has gone up. Okay? You can see the conjunctival autograph, it is so fine that you can barely see. So the uh, conjunctiva has been placed from the opposite eye and it has been sutured here. So this is an autograft and it has not allowed the pterygium to go back again. So this is kindly remember, uh, the conjunctival autograft is the surgery with the least amount of recurrence. That is a very important question which might be asked to you. Pterygiums are tough and the best way is to get it out the first shot. Very well. Then what about the next question is, ladies and gentlemen, we have this, what surgery is being shown? Now, dear me, that, look at that, this triangular thing that is here, right on the limbus, you can see this limbus and you have this cotton swab here. So this triangular thing that we are cutting through the sclera is your, let us see what is being, what are the choices here? A capsule rexin catheter, dear me, no, 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 there is no capsule here. Scleral buccal retinal detachment, we do see a bit of sclera, but is there a buccal? I think not. A trabuclectomy in glaucoma is the correct answer and trifining, trifining in keratoplasty, of course you don't see the trifine, the circular trifine is cutting the cornea. The answer is C. What you are seeing ladies and gentlemen is trabuclectomy in glaucoma because what we do is see we are cutting through the sclera making a partial flap and then we will cut through small area of the trabucular meshwork so it allows the aqueous humor to go under the cunning tire. Okay, so this is what you have seen this particular surgery and this has been asked in a question is a trabuclectomy being performed, can you remember it's, we usually perform a triangular flap here in trabuclectomy. Very well. The next question is what investigation is being shown here and you can see the investigation here clear cut on the retina, the blood vessels all filled up with the dye so this should not be any difficulty. Are we seeing an OCT? Are you seeing a fluorescent angiography? Are you seeing a sheen fluke image? or you see confocal microscope and the answer if you see the choices should be clear to you. This is a fluorescein angiography where you inject the dye sodium fluorescein in the anticubital vein and this dye it travels from the anticubital vein into the eye, takes about 8 to 11 seconds, reaches the eye, fills up the blood vessels of the core and the retina and then we take a photograph of the dye. You can see this all filled up. And if the dye, if everything is normal, if the blood vessels are normal and the retina is normal, then within a few minutes, the blood vessels will empty out of the dye, which will go out of the retina and into the kidneys for excretion. You will see it being cleared out. But if there is a problem, either of the vasculature of the retina, then this dye will leak out of the vessels and into the retina and how it leaks out, the pattern of leakage tells us about the pathology here. So this is the fluorescein angiogram. Kindly remember that these questions should not be missed in the exam. You should be able to identify what investigation. We are not asking the pathology, we are asking what investigation is being done. <coughs> Very well. The next question is identify the object. Now look at that. What is this? First you look at this and this is the inset. So what do you see this peculiar shape and I hesitate to name the shape, what it looks like and you can see that it is being put here. Look at the inset here and it has been put here. What is this? This you can see from the puncta. There is a lower puncta and there is a lower canaliculus, there is upper puncta, upper canaliculi, they will join to, there is a common canaliculus, this is the sac and then LD. So you have this shape thing, it is blocking the, it has been put into the puncta and into the lower canaliculi. So let us look at the choice here. Ozodex implant, an ahmed glaucoma valve, an express implant and a punctal plug and I think you should have got the answer if you have diagnosed it, if you have seen that diagram and look what I am talking about. Because plugging the punctum, these are silicon, usually made of silicon or sometimes collagen also. So we plug the into the punctum, so it blocks the punctum and the canaliculus. Why? So that it is used, you know, that is used in dry eyes. So that when these are, eyes are very dry and when lubricants, you cannot put lubricant here because they are inadequate. So we are blocking the punctum. This is how a punctal plug looks like. We block the punctum 
So in dry eyes, whatever little tears are being produced, so at least they get retained inside the eye, otherwise they would drain down the punctum and into the nasolacrimal duct, into the nose. So that is why, please remember, these are punctal plugs. These are punctal plugs, you can see it very clearly, blocking the punctum. And these are not an ozodex implant, ozodex is a dexamethasone implant. I am with glaucoma valve, these are cetons, the glaucoma valves, an express implant is also a valve used in glaucoma, is made of stainless steel, but what answer is a punctal plug. These two are valves for glaucoma surgeries, Olerix is for retinal problems like diabetics and CRVOs, but the answer we have got here is punctal plug. Please remember, this is how it looks like. It's been asked in the recent exams and it may well be asked again, okay? Very well, I hope I'm not going too fast, though I, my, that has been my besetting sin, I am very fast in every kind of way. Very well. So here goes, the next, this instrument can be used in all except. So first you have to see the instrument and see what it is. Okay, first what it is. And you have to identify this of course. So it appears to be a completely opaque disc with a slit down the center, is it not? And it can be detecting the axis of cylinder refraction, corneal tattooing, Fincham's test, and optical aridectomies. So it says that you can use this thing in all of them except one. Again, can you remember this has been asked in the recent exams. I've picked them up from the recent, all these questions have been picked up from the exams in the last 10, 15 years, except some of them which I made myself, okay? And let's look at that again. So this is a slit down the center of an opaque disc. This is what is called a stenopic slit. A stenopic slit, which you may have read if you have followed my notes or my app or anywhere else, is a stenopic slit is a slit is a slit in a plastic disc usually or a disc like this and a slit down the center like this. So we put the slit and what are the uses? Let's look at the uses. Can we use it in detecting the axis of cylinder in refraction? Yes, we do that actually. So when we are not able to find the axis of cylinder, then we often rotate this, put the slit and roll it in front of the patient's eye and at the axis, axis, correct axis, immediately patient will see a sudden, sharp, clear vision. So we do use it in finding the cylinder. Corneal tattooing, dear me no. Corneal tattooing, you see we use often corneal opacities. In corneal opacities, white is white, so it looks unsightly, so we often tattoo. It's not very used very commonly, but still is done. So we usually put some Indian ink or some black kind of thing to hide the hide the unsightly scar of the corneal opacity. Now, for that, we do not use this. It uh, seems to have no use. But do we use it for a Finchams? Yes, indeed, we do. Finchams, if you remember, is a test to differentiate between the colored halos of cataract and glaucoma. Both of them have color, isn't it? So what happens? We give the slit to the patient and ask him to move the slit in front of the patient like this while looking at the colored halo. And we ask him, what has happened to the colored halo? Okay. Now, as the patient moves the slit in front, so if the colored halo seems to break up, you know, it, individual parts breaks up, it is because of a cataract, okay? But if it doesn't break up as you move like that, it means the colored halo is because of angle closure glaucoma, okay? So that it is used for that. And an optical eye, what is that? Yes, it is also used for optical eye You see why? So optical eye used to be done for patients who have corneal opacities in the center. Now it's blocking the pupil, so the patient is not able to see. So we make a small iridectomy and through that, the patient can see. Let me show you what I mean. Look at that. This is optical eye I mean, This is a scar right in the center of the cornea, is it not? So patient will not be able to see because the pupil is blocked. So what we do, we make a big hole here. We cut into the slice into the iris. It's an iridectomy. It's called optical iridectomy because it allows the patient to see from the eccentric. The pupil may be blocked from the center, but you can see from the periphery. And this is iridectomy is used for patients with central corneal scars. We do use, we do use the cylinders. What we do? How? We ask, the, we dilate the pupil, okay? Because remember, it's scarred, so you cannot see, I dilate the pupil, and then rotate the, we rotate the stenopic slit in front of it, and at the point where the patient has best vision, at the point where the patient has best vision, we perform the iridectomy, because that gives us the best part of the iris to remove so the patient can see. So we do use it in optical iridectomy. The answer is corneal tattooing. Very well. So all these questions have been asked before, as you have What about this? What are the all falling given the instrument are true except? Now, you have to identify the instrument and you see this is a row of 
cylinders, red cylinders. So what is the instrument? Well, we'll talk about this. Let's look at the choices. Is used for quantifying the amount of heterophorias at near distance. Okay, heterophoria means latent squids. A series of high power plus cylinders, which it is. So this is correct. Test is performed distance of six meters. That depends on what you identify the instrument as, is it not? And red line of sight separates from point source of light in heterophoria. Okay, so now the choices should give you the answer. Look at that. The looks this. This is actually this is what is called as a Maddox rod. We all know that a Maddox rod is a series of cylinders. These are high plus power cylinders. So this is correct. This is correct. And it is also performed at six meters. We ask the patient to hold the Maddox rod in front of the right eye and through left eye. We ask him to look at the source of light. Okay, like this. And six meters it is. And the red line of sight. Separates from the point source tells us about heterophoria. This is also correct. So, what is the incorrect? Is the near? Does it remember we do not use Maddox rods for near? That is another instrument for near heterophoria. We use a Maddox wing. Wings, but remember, wings are for near. Ideally, wings should be for distance, but remember, it's opposite. Wings are for near, and rod is for distance. See what I do? Look at that. What we're we doing? So, we have this cylinder. This can be held. This series of cylinders, you can hold it either vertically or you can hold it like this, either vertically or horizontally. What it does, we put it in front of one eye, right eye usually, and ask when to look at a source of light, like this. Okay, see what is right eye? So we have aligned the cylinders vertically, and the left eye is fine looking at the light. And what it does, the left eye sees a point source of light through this white light, but the Maddox rod series it splits the light into a line which is red in color and but it is exactly opposite to the orientation of the cylinder. So this, this is placed vertically as you can see here, it split the light horizontally. If you place it horizontally, it split the light vertically. So in an ideal case, when you ask the patient to put a rod in front and the other is thing, if yes, there is no heterophoria, if the eyes are normal, they are orthophoric, the, you, with one eye you see the white light, the other eye you see the red line they will pass through each other as you can see here it's passing right through that this means the patient has no squint okay but if this has orthophoria if it's not ortho with heterophoria then this red line which will be seen will be either above or below okay so the white line is from the normal eye and the other eye the red line will either above or below tells you that there is a squint since it is in the same plane, so there is no squint in this condition. So this answer is correct. Red line of sight separates from the point source of light in heterophoria. That is correct because you can see they are not separated here, so there is no heterophoria. But if they do separate, the line would be either here or there. Then that means the patient has either hyperphoria or, het or hypophoria. Okay, so the answer is correct. So here, choice, please remember, it is not for near. It is for distance at six meters for near we have a Maddox wing. Very well. So these are little tough questions, but you have to know them. Very well. Identify the procedure being done, and you can see what is being happening. So there's something which is holding this, you can clearly see, is the capsule, and it's tearing the capsule in a fluid motion like this. I hope you will get that, all of you. It's hydrodissection, incorrect. Hydro, there's no water here. Hydrogenation, we don't have a syringe of water here, so it cannot be these two capsule rexes and a posterior capsulotomy. So what you see is a capsule rexes here, as you can see, remember rexes means tearing. So what you're doing is tearing the anterior capsule in a single fluid motion, in a single fluid motion. You don't do a posterior capsulotomy like that. You can't do it. It's too behind, is it not? So what you're seeing here, so what we tear the capsule in a single fluid motion, this is called capsule rexes, also called CCC, continuous curvilinear capsule rexus. This is what is done in a cataract surgery. This is a step, very important critical step in cataract surgery, particularly phaco emulsification. So we are doing a capsule rex. See, all these pictures are important nowadays. A lot of visual questions are being asked in ophthalmology. Very well. <coughs> what next? We have what investigation being performed here? And you see this here. Now, this is a very important test because it's always asked. Look at this thing touching the cornea and this blue light is there, okay? The blue light. Is it pachymetry, which means corneal thickness? Is it biometry, which means IL power calculations? Biometry, remember, is for IL power calculation in cataract surgery, also called as A scan. 
tonometry is intraocular pressure measurement and laser interferometry. Take a look at this again, these are your choices and see what you can identify. Many of us, we've talked about this many times, many times indeed we have talked about this. So let's go back to this, here is the picture again. So this is something, it's the touching the cornea and checking what the blue light tells you. This is an applanation tonometer. Please remember, this is tonometry being performed here, okay. This is the Goldman apnometer asked umpteen times, can you remember this picture, how something touches the cornea and this is a GAT, Goldman apnation tonometer. Very well. What next? We have a child, the longest question, a child suffering from fever and sore throat, complains of watching of eyes, okay, and on examination follicles are found in the lower palpable conjunctiva with tender preolicular lymph nodes. Tender preolicular lymph nodes is here in front of the ear. What is the likely cause? Okay, so from fever and sore throat. May God save us. Complaints of watching of eyes also, okay. Now, follicles are found in the low palpable conjunctiva with tender preolicular nodes. Now, remember, as soon as follicles come out, follicles means typically we have these three or four different diagnoses. It could be viral infection, could be chlamydial infection, could be some drug induced like bromondine and pilocarpine, okay. So, these are usually the three or four most common. So, we have trachoma, we have vernal catar, we have adenoviral conjunctivitis and staphylococcal conjunctivitis, okay. So, the answer here, ladies and men, is going to be, as you can expect, again, is adenoviral conjunctivitis. Look at the congestion of the eyes, okay. Have this discharge, which is usually watery serous discharge. You have tender preorgal lymph nodes and particularly the fever. So, you see, it typically, it's children occur to us like this. They have this viral fever, which affects the throat and this virus travels to the eyes. So, they are watering of the eyes. This is a conjunctivitis. is caused by adenoviral conjunctivitis. Typically, well known for its preorgal lymph nodes, the viral conjunctivitis and the follicles, of course. Why not trachoma? Well, in trachoma, you don't get a fever in sore throat, okay. Trachoma, you get directly into the eyes. Vernal catar, there are no papillary remember, there are follicles, there's no vernal catar. Staphylococcal conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis is not very common. We always remember in conjunctivitis, in infectious conjunctivitis always, the most common is viral conjunctivitis. And number two, in the viral conjunctivitis, the most common is adenoviral conjunctivitis. The answer is C here. So we have this adenoviral conjunctivitis. Very well. <coughs> What next? What next is uh, identify the findings on the retina. Dear me, look at these whitish, weird shaped spots in the retina. Look a little weird. This fluffy kind of a thing. What do you think they look like? Like nothing on earth, as you can presume. And hard exudates. They don't look very hard to me, frankly. They don't look very hard. Dot and blot hemorrhage. Well, they're not hemorrhages at all. You don't see any hemorrhages there. Snowballs and snow banks. Snowballs and snowbanks, well, would it be? Well, maybe. And four choices is the cotton wool exudates, cotton wool spots or the soft exudates, and that is exactly what it is. These are called as soft exudates, which is not quite correct. The better term is cotton wool spots because they look like balls of cotton wool, and that is exactly kind of remember hard exudates are cholesterol deposits, and they are more circumscribed, they're more yellowish, and hard exudates they look like cholesterol have been deposited in the retina. Okay, so they are yellowish and hard looking and granular. But these are soft and fluffy, they look like cotton balls and that's why they're called cotton wool spots and they are not cholesterol deposits, they are because of axoplasmic debris, okay. These are deposits of axoplasm which have leaked out from a dying nerve. The death of the nerves has caused them to come out and deposit on the retina. These are soft exudates, okay. And remember the first different diagnosis of soft exudates in the retina, the most common is hypertension, and diabetes. If you have both choices, I would want you to go for hypertension as number one cause. Second would be diabetes and if once you rule them out, then it could be other causes including HIV or radiation retinopathy, it could be other causes. But the first would be hypertension followed by diabetes. The answer is, it's called a soft exudates or cotton wool spots, okay. So that is the answer we have here. So that seems to be quite simple to me. Very well. <coughs> Identify the person. Now, this look at this thing, this weird shape, and this is always asked, and always you people make some mistake or the other, which is never fits well. Look at the shape. The shape is so characteristic like this. Look at this shape like the branches of a tree, like the branches of a tree. This is the famous dendritic ulcer, the true dendrites with the terminal end bulbs. 
So this is fun, not fungal keratitis, dear me no, you do not see the fluffy feathery margins, the finger like projection. This is not a finger like projection. This is not fluffy feathery margin. This is a clear dendritic ulcer. So this is herpes simplex keratitis and spot on you are. Most of you, I hope you got it right. It is indeed herpes simplex keratitis. Ulcer serpents it is not. It is not proceeding like a serpent, which is a bacterial corneal ulcer caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. And pneumula keratitis. What is that? Pneumula keratitis. Pneumula means coin shape, you know. They are seen often in herpes zoster, pneumula. The pneumus, pneumus means coin shaped lesions. They would look like it. Look at that. These are coin shaped lesions on the cornea. And this is called as pneumula keratitis. They are often seen in herpes zoster. But this is a typical, and you must not repeat, must not make a mistake with this. This is a dendritic ulcer, which is caused by herpes simplex. So please be careful about this. Do not consider this fungus at all. Very well. The next condition we have question for you is in which surgery the following instrument is this being used again and look at this instrument. So it looks like a clamp or a forceps like this. One is this is circular and it is hollow and the other is full. Now what do you think it's used for? This is, could be used for enucleation, taking the eyeball out. Chalazion, which is a chronic inflammatory granuloma of movement glands. Entropion, which is lid margin turning inwards or could be trichiasis with eyelashes turning inwards, okay? And most of you would recognize this. This is a chalazion forceps. You know, it's a chalazion forceps. So chalazion is a painless nodule on the upper or lower, mostly upper, which often happens to people. Many it occurs to young people with oily skins. And it's a psychosomatic condition. So many of you ladies who worry a lot about the oncoming exam, who are worried about them with slightly oily skins, you land up with chalazion. And this is a chalazion which we take out. What we do, something called it's a chalazion, so we do not do a IND, we do incision curatage. So you hold the chalazion in this and evert it like this and scoop it out like that. Okay, so this is a chalazion clamp or a chalazion forceps. This is the answer. Can you remember this? It tells you from this blade, which is hollow, and the other one which will hold the chalazion like this. We have to evert the eyelid and make the incision from under the cunning tan. It's a chalazion forceps. Very well. What's the next is this optic findings typically now look at that this optic is very typical look at the undermine look at the cup here and it is so deep is it not now, is this seen in optic neuritis retrobulb neuritis papilledema or glaucoma and I hope you all got this guy take a look at this again because this is a very typical finding of this particular condition look at this undermining it lies the excavation the deep cup of the optic disc is it deep cupping? This finding is so typical for glaucoma. Okay, remember this cupping, we call it cupping, where it is an excavated area because of the raised intraocular pressure destroying the neuroretinal rim, increasing the size of the cup, which looks so deep and steep edges. Okay, please remember that it is not seen optic neuritis. Optic neuritis, you have a pale disc. Okay, retrobulb neuritis, the disc is normal. Okay, because retrobulb you cannot see, it is not. Papillon will have disc edema, bilateral disc edema. Okay, optimal also have edema, but you'll have unilateral, this is bilateral. It is the glaucomatous disc which looks so excavated, the typical cupping, where it is so deep, which is such an important finding for glaucoma. This is what is typically glaucoma. Of course, you don't get such classic findings, but you should know this is how it looks like. My friends, any questions? Let me just check. If you've got any questions, I'm neglecting your questions. So <clears throat> just let me see if I've got any questions. So you've got, I've got a lot of answers here, okay, and you, are, you have uh, answered quite a lot. You know? We've got uh, Sagnik, who's got in glaucoma, answered correct. Komal has answered correct. And Govardhan has got it correct. Okay, So a lot of good answers we're getting. Well done, well done. <coughs> Very well. So <coughs> what is the name of this chart? Let's take a look at this, and this is an important chart. And this chart is not your Snellen's chart. It's not your Snellen's chart. Do not get fooled by this. This is the Bailey Lavi chart, is it? Is the Sheridan Gardner chart? It's the ETDRS chart, or is it the Tumbling chart? Okay, take a look at this. We have the Bailey Lavi, the Sheridan Gardner, ETDRS, or the Tumbling E chart, and take a look at this again. This is a very famous chart. Remember, this is the gold standard for vision. Remember, the Snellen's chart is the most popular chart for recording vision but it's not the best chart. It's not as scientific as this one. This is the gold standard 
you want to have the best vision chart for your patient, you need this chart. It's called the ETDRS. Okay, this is called the ETDRS chart. Can you remember the ETDRS full form they've asked once. It stands for Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study Chart. Okay, remember it's not for diabetics, it's used for everybody. But because it was invented during this particular famous study, it's given by this name, Early. Can you know this down? Because this has been asked, what is the full form of this chart? Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study Chart. Okay, this is an important chart. This is the best possible chart for recording vision. And series of five letters, you can see the series of five letters. They, <coughs> this is the famous ET chart. This is the best possible, the most scientific chart for recording visual acuity. <coughs> Very well. Then the next question, we have a lot of illustrations. What is this condition, dear me? You see these scales clinging to the eyelashes here? Look at these dandruff-like scales. They look like bits of fluff or dandruff. And that is the clue. They cling to eyelashes here. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is morbonitis? No. Is ulcerative blepharitis? No. In ulcerative blepharitis, you will get the small, small, shallow ulcers in the base of the eyelashes, which you can see they bleed on touch and they're very painful. Is squam it is indeed squamous blepharitis, okay, or also called a seboric blepharitis, where most of us it, it 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 migrates from the scalp. These scales, which are greasy looking, as you can make out, these are greasy scales which migrate from the scalp to the eyelashes and they cling to the eyelashes, making it look a little undesirable. Okay, it's cosmetically not so good, and they look bad, particularly in winters. You'll often see. In no clusters in the winters, it becomes worse. This is a squamous blepharitis, inflammation of lid margins. It's not ulcerative and trichas it is not because trichas means posterior misdirection of the eyelashes. Okay. So this is in this one, which is one of the most common. A lot of patients have this, particularly in winters. So we have to ask them to clean their eyelashes with baby shampoo. Okay. So we have this baby shampoo. And you dilute it a little bit and we ask them to clean it every night and unfortunately it is a very prolonged process. You do it for a couple of months also. And this is the squam. Please identify them by the greasy scales clinging to the upper lashes, which we often see in patients with dandruff. Okay, Very common problem and unfortunately a little prolonged. Okay, So this is squamous blepharitis. In moment that is inflammation of the moment glands, which you will see foam-like thing, you know, because this is more posteriorly located and you'll see foamy secretions. Many of you can see that in your own lids if you stand carefully and peer in the mirror, which many of the ladies do. You will see this foam-like, you know, so bubble-like secretion in severe myobonitis. Also very, very common, but it is not in this particular picture. Myobonitis is not being shown. Very well. The next condition is what procedure is being performed and you can see this man performing and dear me it this man looks a little familiar to me i don't know why i don't know why he looks a little familiar to me i see if you can identify him i think but i can't actually place him but never mind what is he doing is it diet ophthalmoscopy is it retinoscopy is it distant diet ophthalmoscopy or is it indirect ophthalmoscopy so this we have diet ophthalmoscope which is not because remember diet ophthalmoscope is held in the hand like this okay Retinoscopy, dear me, no. Retinoscopy is for checking the power and retinoscope instrument looks a bit like my, my, my um, probe here and you move it like this. Distant direct, you do it at approximately 25 centimeters. But indirect ophthalmoscopy it is because you can see this is the only condition where you have to assume the lying down. I mean, okay, this is the patient lies, not you of course, not that you, you walk in the room, take off your coat and start lying down. The patient lies down is the only examination on the DRPs, darkroom procedures, where the patient lies down and the doctor holds it. This is the indirect ophthalmoscope. Through the light comes. This is the lens of approximately 20 adapters. The light beam focuses on the lens through the condensing lens into the eye, which checks the periphery of that. Now, please remember, indirect ophthalmoscopy checks. This is the, it gives you a panoramic with the bird's eye view of the entire retina of the entire retina means the disc for your macula which is the central retina, the peripheral which is the ora serrata. So you want to perform a complete examination of the retina, you do an indirect ophthalmoscopy like this man is doing, this gentleman is doing, but I really can't identify him, he looks very, very familiar to me, I don't know why. Very well. So therefore, we have the answers indirect ophthalmoscopy and then what is the diagnosis? Dear me, this looks like 
a lot of incrustation here with a lot of idle tears here. So is it an ophthalmic unitorum? Is it a bufthalmos? Is it congenital nasolacrum duct obstruction, NLDO? Or is it angular conjunctivitis? Take a look at this again. We have these four choices. Angular means the angles of the eye, mostly the lateral canthus, okay? Congenital natural nasolacrum duct means these are often in kids who are born and the NLD is blocked because of the Hasner's valve is not canalized. Bufthalmos is a large eye with the raised intraocular pressure. Ophthalmic neutrum is a child within the first one month who has conjunctivitis. And see if you identify the answer is clearly congenital NLD or nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. About six to seven percent of the kids have this where the valve of Hasner which guards the nasal lacrimal duct is usually not patent. So you would identify this by the classic triad of three things, which is the watering or the lacrimation, the matting of eyelashes and the discharge. Okay, so classic triad, please remember, the discharge here which you can see, the water coming out of the eyes and the matting of eyelashes, they get matted together, stuck together. This is a typical congenital nasolacrimal duct of NLDO. And remember, the important different diagnosis between bufthalmos and this, this is very dangerous. You see why? Because this is a raised intraocular pressure. And this also, the, if you remember the classic triad, is also has lacrimation, it is a blepharospasm, and it has blepharospasm and photophobia. So, the photophobia, remember, despite the fact that these patients have a lot of watering, they are never photophobic. So, it's easy to identify, but they are never photophobic or blepharospasm, but there is lacrimation here. So, the most important, important different diagnosis here is not to make a mistake of bufthalmos for congenital NLDO, okay? Because bufthalmos would also have blepharospasm and photophobia, which will distinguish it, apart from the large size of the eyeball. Because this is the most important different diagnosis, but the answer here is CNLDO. I'm sure all of you have got it. Very well. So, what next? Identify the DME. That's looks like a very different kind of look at these glands which have been this is what has been drawn and let us see if we can identify them these are the zeiss glands or some called called the zeiss glands are they the glands of mole are these accessory lacrimal glands or are these the moment glands and see if we can answer them again we have the choice again we have to look at these peculiar distribution of the glands fluffy like this look is very very distinctive here and is it the Z's glands remember these glands are the glands this is not the Z's gland let me tell you the answer the Z's glands are glands on the eyelid margin remember this is the eyelid margin okay the eyelid margin and there's the lid proper which been inverted like this so on the lid margin these are glands which are located at the base of the eyelashes and these are modified sebaceous glands okay so they are at the base of the eyelashes these are modified sebaceous glands they are not these glands are the glands of mole? The glands of mole are also on the lid margin and they are modified sweat glands. They modified sweat glands. So these are not glands of mole either. Accessory lacrimal glands, remember, lacrimal glands, accessory lacrimal glands are present in the conjunctiva and they provide the basic secretion of the tears. Okay? They secrete the aqueous component of the tears. This is not that. So what is left are the meboman glands. Yes, indeed. These are the longitudinal, the parallel. Mewoman glands, you can see here, the longitudinal, the parallelly arranged mewoman glands, they secrete the mebum, which forms the oily layer of the tear film, which is there for prevention of evaporation. Okay, remember, we have this three-layered, all of you remember the three-layered structure of the tears, is it not? We have this three-layered structure of the tears, which is called the three-layered sandwich, a bit of a club sandwich our tears are. The outermost layer is the lipid layer, which prevents evaporation. This is the mebum. This is the mebum, which is the secretion of the mebum glands, which you were just seeing. The second layer is the aqueous layer of that. This forms the major bulk of the tears. And this is by the accessory lacrimal glands we have just mentioned. And the innermost layer is the mucin, which is secreted by the goblet cells of the conjunctiva, which is therefore stabilizing of the tear film. So what we saw were the mewoman glands secreting the mewbin, the mebum, and this is how they look like. This is how they look like. So this is the, now the glands have been identified. I am sure most of you have got this right. Very well. So what's next? The next question what we're having here is a, uh, 
bit of a disturbance here as it picks up the signal, you know, technical issues, ladies and gentlemen, kindly uh, forgive me for these technical issues because uh, this seems to have uh, caught, just give us a second while we handle this and we get the picture back on. While we, ha, here we've got it back and let's hope it works like this. Now, what we have here is the next picture coming up. Yes, so we've got this right. Thank you very much, my friends, for attending to it. And now identify the given glasses and you can see this given glasses here. We have the glasses here. We have the trifocal lenses, which means there are three focal. I can't see three different focal, can you? Well, I can't either. Bifocal, I can see one focus, we can see another, but that might well be true. Progressive lenses, it is not because progressive lenses, you do not have two different lenses, you cannot see the cut here. Or are they cylindrical lenses? They are not. So I think you should have all got them. They are indeed bifocal lenses where you have one focus for distance, one for the near. This is for reading because remember when we read, we turn like this. So this is usually positive and if you are a myop, then you would the upper, upper segment will be concave lenses. And if you have metrope, they will be convex lenses. So these are bifocal lenses, which the emetropic patients do not have to wear. But those of you who are ametropic, myopics, hypometropics, you will have to wear this at 45 or 40 when you turn press bar. Because remember, you cannot avoid press bar. It will come to you sooner or later. Not? So these are bifocal lenses. The top segment is for distance, could be concave lens for myopics or convex lens for hypometropics. The bottom segment is a convex lens for reading. This is a bifocal lens. I'm sure you all got this correct. Very well. The next thing is all of them are true about the orbit except. So we've got an orbit question here. Let's look at the orbit. Consists of seven bones. That's first. The lateral wall is the thickest part of the orbit. Okay. It has a volume of 6 ml and the angle between the two lateral walls is 90 degree. Okay. So let's look at the orbit and what this says. And this is the orbit and you see the superior the inferior, the middle wall and lateral wall. And you can see that this indeed is the thickest, is the most thickest wall is a lateral wall, the thinnest wall, the middle wall, okay? So this is lateral wall is thickest. That This answer at least is correct, thickest part. And does it concern us? Yes, indeed it does. If you remember the rule of seven, orbit obeys rule of seven, seven bones, seven muscles, it has and seven nerves, okay? So we have the seven bones, seven muscles and the seven nerves, the rule of seven of the orbit, so this is also correct. So this is also correct. And the angle between two lateral walls, so if this is one lateral, this other one, is it 90 degree? Yes, it is 90 degree also, which we can see here. Look at that. This is a good nice diagram. You see this is the two orbits, okay? The two orbits are like an inverted pyramid. The shape is a pyramid shape. Kindly remember if they ask you the shape of the orbit, you will say a pyramid or like a pier or a pier. So this is the base of the pyramid which opens on the face. This is the apex of the pyramid, which goes inward. So this, look at the two middle walls. They are at 90 degrees of each other. Look at the two lateral walls. They are at 90 degrees of each other. The two middle walls are parallel, and the two lateral walls are at 90 degrees, which is also correct. And also remember kindly that the angle between the middle wall and lateral wall is 45 degrees, okay? And this is the two orbits, and they are facing slightly outwards, as you can imagine, like this. So you can see the eyeball faces anteriorly, but the orbit faces slightly laterally. So remember, the orbital axis is somewhat like this, but the optical axis is in front. So there is an angle between them, which you can see is about 22 degrees. You don't have to memorize this. There are too many figures to memorize. Life is short. Memory is precious. You don't have to memorize everything. But they are at 90 degrees. The two middle walls are parallel. The angle between the middle and the lateral wall is 45 degrees. So what is incorrect? is the volume is not 6 ml. This is the volume 6 ml of the eyeball. We talk about the orbit, the orbital volume is 30 ml. It's 30 ml. So all the statements are correct, except this one. This is the answer which we wanted. So this is the, you can see the thick middle wall, the floor, the superior walls, and the thin middle wall. Very well, so we've got that. And then the next question is, Inaccurate measurement of which one of them is the most common source of error in IL power calculation. Now, that's a very good question. You see, when we calculate, when you do cataract surgeries, 
have to individually calculate your IL powers. Every patient undergoes an IL power calculation. Okay, like each of you have individual spectacle powers. Similarly, each of you have different IL powers. We have to calculate individually. And if you don't calculate them correctly, if you do not calculate them correctly, a post-operative vision is going to be very poor. Okay. So already patient has no accommodation after cataract surgery because of loss of lens. On top of that, if you put an incorrect IOL, then there will be no distance vision. So near vision you have destroyed by taking out the lens, distance vision you've got incorrect IOL, patient is in deep trouble and so will the doctor be. So what are the sources of error? Let's take a look at that. Is it the axial length of the eye? Is it the corneal curvature? Is it the AC depth or the lens thickness? We have these four parameters which we need to measure for for keratometer for for IL power calculation, which is called biometry. Okay, so this is IL power calculation. Look at this. We need to measure the keratometry, corneal curvature. We need to measure the axial length, which is this one. And a very important thing is the ELP. It stands for effective lens position. Okay, ELP stands for effective lens position. What is that? This is the position the intraocular lens will take. It is a calculation which is difficult to make because you're predicting. You see where the intraocular lens will sit. So it could sit a little anteriorly, it could be a little posterior. This is called ELP, effective lens position. And this is a little difficult to calculate. But remember, the most common source of error is the calculation of the axial length. Okay, Because we need to measure the axial length, this is the most common source of error in IL power calculation. So whenever we calculate IL power, we have to be particularly careful with the axial length which gives us the maximum problems. You correct this, you calculate this wrongly, you get a wrong IL power, you get a lot of bad words after the surgery from the patient. Be careful about the axial length. Very well. The next question is a patient complains of inability to drive at night, particularly if it's raining or foggy. His vision is six by six. But then why is he not able to drive at night? Which aspect of his visual performance needs to be checked? He is 6 by 6, vision is absolutely correct. So then why is he not able to drive at night despite the rain or the fog or whatever it is? Color vision, visual fields, maybe. Contrast sensitivity, or binocular vision, what do you think? This is a very good question put in a very nice way. I like this question very much. Color vision at night, not important because anyway he is not seeing any colors. Visual fields, yes, yes, possible. Contrast sensitivity, binocular vision. So look at how night driving. This is a gentleman driving through his car window at night. You can see his wheel here. And look at the objects, you know. It's night, it's raining. The light is poor and in that middle of that poor light he's driving through. This is a performance of contrast sensitivity. One of the most important parameters of visual performance is contrast sensitivity, okay. Remember contrast sensitivity is the difference between the background lighting and the foreground lighting. So when you have a bright contrast that you can easily read, like the high contrast charts of Snellen's visual fields, visual charts where you have a white background and a black. These are high contrast, anybody can read them. But when there's a difference of lighting between the two, you know, when there's not much difference. Low contrast lighting means a foggy night or a rainy night where the lighting is poor outside and inside also. Then you have problems, you bash into the pavement, you crash into a passing a casual cow, okay and you run over an even more casual postman or whatever. That is the problem of a contrast sensitivity. Please remember, vision, visual acuity is not the most important part of your visual performance. There are other things also, visual fields, color vision, contrast, but in this particular question, in a dark night when it's raining or foggy, it is the contrast sensitivity which prevents you from running over a casual dog or an even more casual pedestrian. It is contrast sensitivities. Very well. What's the next question? Which of the following is the most common ocular manifestation of COVID-19? Okay, this was asked in a couple of weeks back, and this is your important question. We all know, or I hope you know, COVID is still not over. Please remember, is it retinal vein occlusion? Is it pseudomembranous conjunctivitis? It's follicular conjunctivitis and it's viral creatures. You see how we change the question. See, making an MCQ is all about changing the answer. Most of you know the answer. But we just change the choice that you have there, is it not? So look at that. We all know the most common ocular manifestation is a viral conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is the single most ocular common manifestation of COVID-19, okay, conjunctivitis. But it has given you three different types of conjunctivitis. So the answer is follicular conjunctivitis. Okay, remember viral 
viral conjunctivitis cause follicles and this is the follicular conjunctivitis you will find out. It is not a pseudomembranous conjunctivitis which looks like this. See, pseudo, this is a pseudomembranous, this yellowish thing you see at the, at the phonicial conjunctiva is a pseudomembrane. Okay? This is formed in very severe conjunctivitis and it requires a lot of treatment. Sometimes steroids are required to treat this. Okay? But what it is, it is a follicle conjunctivitis because remember most viral conjunctivitis will cause follicles. It's not a keratuviatus, it's not a pseudomembrane and of course it is not a little vein occlusion. So most of you would know the answer is conjunctivitis but you would get foxed here thinking is it follicular, is it pseudomembrane? The answer is that it's just plain conjunctivitis and because all viral conjunctivitis produces follicles, the answer is follicular conjunctivitis. It is all about just changing the choice. Very well then. What's the next question is which anti-glaucoma drug is contraindicated in the third trimester of pregnancy? Okay. Again, of course an easier question would have been which is contraindicated in the pregnancy as such, but we have mentioned more specific third trimester and I think you should all get this Timolol, which is a beta blocker, Latinoprost, which is a prostaglandin analog, plus prostaglandin analog, a dozolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, Bremonidine, which is alpha 2 agonist. Now, what do you think is the correct answer? It could be anything, but the specific is third trimester. The third trimester, you see, by that time, organogenesis has already occurred. So, the most important here is latinoprost. Why? Because this is a prostaglandin analog, and prostaglandin analog can cause a cervical incompetence. It may cause premature delivery, is it not? So, please remember, when you have prostate analogs, they may cause a premature delivery of the child, particularly in third trimester, extremely dangerous. We must avoid latinoprost at all costs. Okay? Very good. I'm sure most of you have got this right. What next? We've identified this was again asked a couple of weeks back in the INSET paper, and I would ask you to look at this again. So we have this image here where you have this peculiar darkish color ring somewhere on the lens capsule. That's what I make it out. So is it a cave ring? K is a flash ring. Is it a Weiss ring? Is it a Wasius ring? Or is it a Fleischer's ring? Okay. An answer I hope we've all got it is the Wasius ring. This one, see Wasius ring is a ring on the anterior capsule which you get when you get hit in the eye. Okay. A blunt trauma can often cause a Wasius ring. A cave ring, you know, is a case of Fleischer ring. Wilson's disease, you get it on the cornea, is it not? This is not on the cornea. A Fleischer's ring is in keratoconus. Again, it's a corneal ring, but it's in keratoconus. Again, it's in the cornea. It's not the cornea. A V string is in the vitreous. A V string is a ring of, is condensed vitreous, which is there in posterior vitreous detachment. You see it in the vitreous. It's not in the vitreous. A Vossius ring, how you get a Vossius ring, remember, is that supposing that you have, get a blow in the eye. I hope not, but suppose you have an argument with one of your friends and you wax you in the eye, okay? Most of you are getting more and more intolerant nowadays. And see what happens. As the blunt trauma comes, so this iris goes, it gets hits behind, it goes and hits the lens capsule. As it hits the lens capsule, there's a lens capsule. So it leaves an imprint of the pupil on the lens capsule. So an anterior lens capsule, you get a ring of pigment like this. Okay, this is the imprint of the pupil and the ring of pigment left on the anterior capsule is called the Vossius ring. Remember the peculiar part of this ring is that it will always be smaller than the size of the pupil diameter. You can see the clearly the pupil diameter is wide, but the ring diameter is small. That's why because when you get hit like this at the point of impact, the pupil constricts. The pupil constricts. So it's the constricted pupil which hits the anterior lens capsule and that's why the diameter of the Vossius ring is always smaller than the diameter of the pupil. Okay, and I'm sure most of you got this very well done. Now, give me a second while I look at if your answers and at some of your questions if I have got them. You've got you've got a lot of answers correct here. We've got Sagnik correct again, and we've got Komal correct again. We've got <coughs> uh, we've got uh, uh, Gaudaman correct also. There are a lot of good answers we've been getting. Ayush has got this correct. Wonderful. So we've got a lot of answers. Keep it up. So I think we are rapidly coming to the end of this. I'm sure you're getting tired, but I'll finish this fast because we don't have too much time, as you know. So we have this five-year-old child with squint comes to you for opinion, suspecting accommodative squint. You order a cyclopedic refraction. Which drug believes? Okay, again, we have the choice here. We have pilocarpine, cyclopentylate, tropicamide, and atropine. 
okay so a child comes to you with squint something like this okay you have a squint here now you suspect he's got accommodative squint because that is the most common type of squint remember accommodative squint is usually the most common type of squint in children particularly above two years of age okay suspecting accommodative squint you order a cyclic refraction but which drug will be used and you should is that pilocarpine incorrect pilocarpine is not a cyclopegic cyclopentotropic monatropine it is and you got right it's mostly atropine you see why because remember see these are children it's a five-year-old child remember children are mostly hypermetropic all remember at birth we are all hypermetropic around 2.5 diopters and most children are hypermetropic and because they are hypermetropic so use a lot of accommodation is not look whenever you suspect a child or any patient to be hypermetropic we have to do a cyclopegic refraction is not so this is hypermetropia which means the rays of light are focusing behind the retina like this okay so what these guys do they all cause accommodation accommodation means increasing the power of the lens by making the lens more curved is not so increase the curvature of the lens and increase the curvature so the power of increases and this now focus rays on the retina so all hypermetropes subconsciously or unconsciously let's say accommodate they get in the habit of accommodating so you can get the rays on the retina so when they accommodate okay so they get the rays their vision is correct so when they come to us because they are accommodating they also converge you remember they are linked together it's not it's a buy one get one free every time you accommodate you converge also so it's because of excessive accommodation you excessively converge land up with convergent squint okay so they come to the squint so we suspect children because they are usually hypermetropics they are accommodating and to we have to do the correct refraction because every time is accommodating and vision is on the retina he gets six by six so we have to paralyze the accommodation to get the correct refraction that is why we order a cyclopegic refraction so they paralyze the ciliary muscle they can no longer use accommodation to get it on the retina so we get the correct power so children always accommodate and because it's a very small child five year old so we use the most powerful cyclopegic which we have at our disposal which is atropine is it not atropine is the single most powerful drug which causes the maximum competition for children up till five to seven years of age we always use atropine the answer is atropine and as you can see child comes to squint and how do i know accommodate squint because the minute i get his accommodation right i give him glasses look at the squint it disappears completely okay this is the power of glasses and is a common squint because only squint is defined as squint due to uncorrected refractive error this poor kid was accommodating too much he's a hypermetro is accommodating too much to see clearly with accommodation comes convergence so you got a convergent squint the minute we give him glasses he improves immediately okay so we have the answer here is atropine and i'm sure most of you have got this right very well what's next next thing is a 75 year old lady complains of a gradually progressive blurring of a distance vision accompanied by a paradoxical improvement of near vision dear me one improving the other worst thing okay what is the probable diagnosis is it an open angle glaucoma is it a nuclear cataract is it a cortical cataract or is it a age related macular degeneration all of them seem plausible but i think most of you got this right of a slowly progressive blurring of distance vision accompanied by a paradoxical improvement near vision in which condition your near vision improves but the distance worsens and you are quite right it is a nuclear cataract look at the amber color in the center this is a nuclear sclerosis occurring causing cataract this is the famous second sight phenomena it's called second sight because why second sight because again at 75 you've got your vision back again for near vision you see what happens this is a nuclear cataract and this is a very famous phenomena called second sight let's talk about this quickly <coughs> i am trying to wind up as early as possible i know that you do not have so much time but i hope this is all going to help you in exam so what is this see this is a, a 75 year old lady okay now remember a 70 or 75 year old lady the distance vision is here okay assume is emetropic but for near vision because remember the rays for near diverge like this so they become parallel later and focus somewhere here okay So remember, this is for distance. This is for near. This is a typical patient. So normally, what happens? Patient, this is vision six by six, but near vision is there, and they need to wear glasses because they are presbyopic. The old people, they have no accommodation, so need glasses for near. Okay, this is what. 
Now this patient develops a nuclear cataract, which is here center. What does nuclear cataract? It causes increase of refractive index because the nuclear fibers they get packed even more close. They increase the refractive index. Okay, and you know that when they increase the refractive index, then more the index, more the bending of light, is it not? So what happens? Both the distance and near, because they have to pass through the increased refractive index, they they can bend more light. The increased refractive index tends to bend more light. So remember this distance vision, which was focused on the retina, now focuses here because why? The increased refractive index of the densely packed cataract forces the light to focus earlier. So look at this patient. His distance vision worsens. Because initially it was on the retina, now it comes here. But so does near. The near, which was focusing behind, this also poor. You see, both of them move in front because the increased refractive index. So distance was there, near was there. So distance comes there, but near one comes here. See what happens? The near one now focuses on the retina. The near one focuses instead of focusing there. The near one now focuses on the near. Okay. So remember, this was near this distance. Both of them shifted forward because of increased refractive index. So what's happened? The near vision improves on the retina because it's falling on the retina, but the distance vision worsens. So this causes a paradoxical increase in near vision. Page the doctor. Previously, I used to need glasses for near vision. Now I can see without the near glasses, and that's called second sight. This occurs typically only in nuclear cataracts because of the increased refractive index. Caused by the nuclear cataracts. Okay, so please remember, this is the answer. Is a nuclear cataract. What we're talking about is paradoxical increase of near vision. Improved near vision is called second sight. A very common phenomena, which is seen in nuclear cataracts. Very well. The next question we have is, what is this instrument used for? Now look at this instrument. This seems to be a new instrument to most of you. And we have these two lenses, you know, at 90 degrees to each other. Is it a color vision testing? Is it for refining of the cylindrical axis, visual acuity, or is it for refractive error estimation? And take a look at this again. Refractive error estimation means a retinoscope. Visual acuity means the Snellens kind of a chart. Refined cylinder axis, and this is a color vision test, which means could be a kind of a chart which we like any of the color vision. Chart. But what does it look like? So these are two lenses. This is a please remember this picture. This can be asked. The old timers used to ask this. This is a famous instrument called the Jackson's cross cylinder, JCC we call it, JCC, Jackson cross. What is this cross? It's called a cross cylinder because it's a combination of two cylinders of the same power, two cylinders of the same power, but opposite sides, plus and minus, at 90 degrees to each other. That's why it's called a cross cylinder. Okay, And what is it used for? It is used for refining the cylindrical axis. You flip the JCC and refine the cylindrical axis. So what is, happens? is that once you've got the patient's vision at a particular point, you flip the cylinder, okay? What does flipping means? You pick it up like this, like this, and you place it in the front of the patient's, like this, and you do it like this. You flip it like one side and the other eye, and ask if the vision is improving or worsening, and you progressively shift the cylindrical axis accordingly. So we refine the axis. The answer here is that it is used for refining the cylindrical axis the best, so it moves towards plus 90 or minus 90, you refine the cylindrical axis with this Jackson's cross cylinder, which is you flip it one side and the other side, ask where the vision gets better, and you shift the cylindrical axis accordingly. Okay? Kindly remember, this is a very famous instrument which is not used as commonly as it should be nowadays, but it's a very, very important instrument called JCC. Very well. Now the next, the best treatment option for severe congenital ptosis with poor LPS action. Now that's an important question. We have a poor levator palpis superior action. Okay, poor. So let's look at this. This is ptosis. Ptosis. For severe congenital, so is a child born with severe ptosis? Is it a LPS dissection from the skin side? Is it a LPS dissection from the conjunctival side? Okay. Is it a frontalis suspension surgery with facial latter? Or is it a fascinless server surgery? Now let's look at uh, the severe congenital ptosis. Look at that. This is very severe ptosis, which you can see the lids not even clearing the visual axis. Very severe ptosis. And now remember what surgery we do. These are the most popular surgeries, of course, LPS dissection. LPS dissection, cut the LPS. But LPS dissection is only done when you have a very good LPS action. Okay. 
And if LPS resection is only done, we have a good LPS, only a good LPS action can, we can make it more powerful. So what we do in this case, look how do we measure LPS is we ask the patient to look down, okay, and we place the scale here, and then we ask to look up, the maximum, you know. So down, so you place the zero mark here, ask the patient to open the lid after occluding the forehead, so the frontalis cannot work, you occlude like this, ask the patient to look up from down and looks up like this. So you see what has happened here that this is zero mark and maximum it has gone up. So this is somewhere, this is one, uh, there's about 10 millimeters, so it's around 13 to 14 millimeters is pro approximately here. This is the LPS action, okay? This is how we measure the LPS. And what are the guidelines? The guideline says the LPS in action decides the choice of surgery. What is that? If it's good LPS, if more than 12 millimeters is called excellent, okay? Action of 12 millimeters, we're measured by that, is excellent, okay? If it is 9 to 11, it's supposed to be good. It's okay, it's not excellent, but if less than F4, then it's poor. If it's not moving at all, poor LPS, okay? Remember, for poor LPS, a frontalis sling surgery is important. So what we do, we take facial latter from the thigh and we attach it to the frontalis muscle. So when you use wrinkles of the frontalis, it lifts a lid up like that, okay? So please remember, for poor LPS, we do a frontalis sling. For good and excellent LPS, we do a LPS resection, okay? So you can see here, this was the severe ptosis and after doing a frontalis suspension, the wrinkling the frontalis pulls the lid up and they are fine now. So the answer here, ladies and gentlemen, is because it's a severe cannulitis with poor LPS, remember less than four millimeters, we do a frontalis suspension surgery. It's called frontalis suspension or sling with facial latter or it could be other stuff like Gore-Tex and all. So kindly remember the guidelines, again, poor LPS, we do frontalis, good or poor fair LPS would be LPS resection, okay? So that's a good question for you. Very well. What about this? A 30-year-old lady with history of wearing soft contact lenses for 15 years, that's a lot of years, soft contact lenses 15 years, presents with irritation, redness, itching, and mucus accumulation in eyes. Of course, a lot of you people also. On examination, superior tarsal conjunctiva shows papillae more than 0.3 millimeters in size. What is the best initial management? Is it do topical steroids? Is to um, culture in the contact lens solution, which we do in, when you suspect corn ulcer. We discontinue the lenses for two to four weeks, or is it to start antibiotic psychopathic in the anticipation of a corneal ulcer, okay? Look at the question. So a lady wearing soft contact lenses for 15 years, presents with irritation, redness, itching, and mucus accumulation, okay? Superior tarsal conjunctiva has this papillae. So this papillae is actually means 0.3 millimeter size. It is a giant papillary conjunctiva. Look at this, this giant papillary. These are the flat top papillae again, okay? And this is called GPC. Whenever they are more than three millimeters, 0.3 millimeter size, big pardon, 0.3, we call it giant papillae. This is the single most common ocular side effect of contact lens wear. Those of you who wear contact lenses and you sleep in them, you know, you line up with GPC and call this irritation and itching and mucus accumulation. You cannot stand after something, you have to discontinue lenses, okay? So the question is, what is the best initial management? Remember, it is, the papillae tells you it's GPC and there's no pain or loss of vision, so there's not a corneal ulcer. So we do not have to do anti-pattern cycloplegic and we do not have to culture the contact lens and of course we do not topical steroids. The first thing is to discontinue the lens for about two to four weeks because it is the mechanical rubbing of the lens against the conjunctiva, it is the mechanical <coughs> damage caused by the lens edge which is causing the GPC. We diagnose GPC from the size of the papillae and from the fact that itching and redness and irritation. This is, you discount, this is the first thing to be done and if it resolves, usually within four weeks, they are fine and they can put on the lens again. If it doesn't work, then we sometimes we have to go to more stringent measures like starting with mast cell stabilizers and going on to sometimes topical steroids also. Okay, so the answer, ladies and gentlemen, asked for the initial management is first thing is to discontinue the lens for two to four weeks. Many of you need this treatment. Okay, do this. Very well. So what's next? What's next we have is a 50-year-old librarian presents with ocular irritation and pain, ocular irritation pain. While applying makeup, she notices that the eyelids appear to be different. Dear me, one eyelid here, the other eyelid there, okay? That's not going to be very nice. What is the most likely cause, okay? Again, 50-year-old librarian, ocular irritation and pain, applying makeup, she applies, notices that the eyelids appear to be different heights. 
what is the most likely cause. You know, when I was going to libraries at your age, none of the librarians would wear makeup. I don't know why. They do it now probably. So let's take a choice. Trachoma. Could it be trachoma? Rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid eye disease, or myasthenia gravis. Now look at that. So we have this ocular irritation and pain. Remember, when you have ocular irritation and pain, non-specific pain, it points to one thing. Irritation and pain and double vision sometimes. And remember, these are three things. They should point the things. Irritation, non-specific ocular pain, and particularly sometimes diplope, double vision, points the finger usually to thyroid eye disease, particularly seen in a 50 year old. Remember, women in 50s to 70 year old groups often have thyroid eye disease, almost five times more common than in men. And typically, why is she applying, I mean, I beg your pardon, I mean, why it is, the question is not why is she applying makeup, why are the lids at different lengths, different heights? Because the most common presentation of thyroid disease, which is lid retraction, is it not? And look at that. This is why the lids are at different levels because the most common presentation of thyroid eye disease is not proptosis. It's not proptosis. Many of you make that mistake. The most common ocular manifestation is lid retraction. The lids have gone back, exposing one of the sclera. So that's why there are different levels and it's explained by this because of pain, non-specific pain and irritation. It is indeed choice C. I hope most of you got this right. Very well. The next question we have is a 65-year-old lady complains of gradually progressive blurring of vision in both eyes. So gradually progressive loss of vision, particularly worse in the mornings and on coronal, on examination of coronal gateta, it's called gateta, are seen on Desmet's membrane. What is the diagnosis? Is bullous keratopathy, fuchsial dystrophy, granular dystrophy, and postipolymorphism. Now remember, 65-year-old lady comes of gradually progressive blurring of vision in both eyes, particularly worse in the morning. This is the clue. Worse, both eyes, particularly in the mornings. The second clue, almost diagnostic, is the famous cornea gateta, seen in Desmet's membrane. The answer here is Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. Is the look at that? Look at the corneal edema here. See what is happening here? On the Desmet's membrane, there is corneal gateta. Okay, corneal, the presence of corneal gateta, which are excrescences on the Desmet's membrane, and they cause a dysfunction of the endothelium. So the endothelium is not able to pump the aqueous out. You all know that the single most important layer in the cornea is the endothelium. That is because it is the one that maintains your transparency. You know, this is the endothelial layer. Suppose this is the endothelium. And this is the iris. This is the aqueous humor. Okay? The aqueous humor is always trying to enter the coronal endothelium or the cornea. But because of the endothelial pumps which are located the sodium potassium ATPS pumps which are located in the endothelium, they are being pushed out by the endothelium. Now this endothelium is damaged because of the cornea gateta present in the Desmet's membrane and they are not able to pump the aqueous out. So what happens? At night as the patient sleeps and, and with her dreams, what is happening is not so pleasant. The aqueous humor is making its way into the cornea endothelium. Why? because endothelial pumps are damaged. This does not happen to a healthy eye because there are no coronal gateta. In my eyes, there is no coronal gateta, neither in your eyes. So while we sleep at night with pleasant dreams, as the aqueous tries to make it, it is being repulsed, thrown out by the endothelial pumps. But not in this lady because the coronal gateta has damaged the endothelium, so the aqueous humor is coming in. So in the morning when she wakes up, she has this coronal edema because the, you can see the edema here because the endothelium is not been able to pump it out. Okay, that's why in the morning. But as she gets up and the eyelids are open, then the evaporation starts. Remember, at night she's sleeping, the lids are closed, there is no evaporation. But in the morning, she's opened the lids, there's a lot of evaporation. So in the morning, the vision is poor, but by the end of the afternoon, the vision clears because the evaporation caused by the opened eyelids now, okay? So that is the trick, remember, in both eyes, particularly worse in the morning, and corneal gateta tells us it's going to be fuchs and dystrophy, one of the most common indications for keratoplasty. Sooner or later, this lady will require a penetrating keratoplasty, a PK. Okay? So that's the typical history of getting up in the morning with hazy vision. Next question, a patient presents with blurring of vision on investigation comes up with a chart like the one present. Okay? What is the pathology? Okay, so what has happened? We give her this chart with these lines and we ask them to draw the lines according as they are seen. And to a surprise, look at that, they have not drawn the line straight they have drawn like this, it's distorted. Ideally, it should have been a straight line because this is the 
chart given to them and the patient has been thrown, given a pen and asked to draw the lines as he sees. But this, this distorted this there, this is the famous Amsler's grid, isn't it? Amsler's grid. So where does the pathology, is it in the lens, like it would be a cataract, incorrect. Optic nerve, incorrect. Cornea, incorrect. This is in the macula because remember, this is the Amsler's grid is picked up metamorphopsia. This is distortion of the straight lines which is called as metamorphopsia. This is the one clear sign that the macula is damaged. Remember, whenever the fovea macula is damaged, as an ARMD or CSR or CME, you will have two important features of macular, dist macular disorder. A central loss of vision and metamorphopsia, a distortion of vision, which is clearly brought out by the Amsler's grid, which the patient has drawn like this. The answer is in the macula. Very well. The next thing is a band-shaped keratopathy. <clears throat> and your ordeal is about to end, I hope. The BSK, Banship Keratopathy, is caused by deposition of copper, magnesium, calcium or iron. But what is a Banship Keratopathy? Look at that. This is, as it says, on the cornea, you get this band, peculiar band shape like this. This is called a BSK, okay. This is predominantly made up of calcium. The answer is calcium salts. They deposit here. There are many causes of BSK, remember, but the most common is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So you will see this in long-standing JRA patients. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis will come to us with uveitis. You will see the typical BSK here in the shape of a honeycomb because of the, you can see the typical distribution. We often call it a Swiss cheese appearance of BSK. And this is because it was of, of the calcium on the Bowman's membrane and typical honeycombing or the Swiss cheese appearance because on the Bowman's membrane they get deposited like that. So this is calcium salts. Very well. BSK is often seen in uveitis, particularly long standing uveitis caused by JRM. The next patient is a 60 year old patient of long standing diabetes mellitus. Notice sudden musque, musque volitantis, musque remember, you have these flies, okay, and blurring of vision. On exam, his fundal red glow was dim and no details of the fundus could be seen. Okay, again. So a 60-year-old patient, long-standing diabetes, we have diabetes with sudden musky. Musky is floaters, you know, the musky is the name for floaters. This buzzing mosquito-like thing, extremely irritating. So suddenly notice this sudden onset floaters with blurring of vision. But in examination, the fundal red glow was dim and no details of the fundus could be seen. But why ever not? So there are two problems. You cannot see the normal red glow and you cannot see the retina. Could he have CME? Could he have retinal detachment? Could you have new vascular coma or could you have vitreous hemorrhage? Okay, you could have any of them because all those in a diabetes CME, detachments, new vascular coma, which all of them can be seen in diabetics. So you have to take the best chance. Look at the floaters and loss of vision and the fundal red glow is dim. The answer is vitreous hemorrhage. Why you can't see the retina is because of this because the hemorrhage is obscuring the vitreous. And you normally know this is normal red glow. This is a fundal red glow, healthy red glow. If you have a normal eye, you should normal red glow. But when you have vitreous hemorrhage, it blocks the glow and actually there is no glow. The best in a total vitreous hemorrhage, you will have no glow. But even if you have no glow, so we have not mentioned no glow because that would give you the clue. We have seen dimming of the fundal red glow. So there is a dimming of the fundal red glow and you cannot see the details of the retina because the retina cannot be seen because the vitreous is full of blood. The answer is vitreous hemorrhage. Glow was dim. No details of retina could be seen with vitreous hemorrhage. Remember, floaters, loss of vision, it is vitreous hemorrhage indeed. So you see, these are all questions which have been taught to you by various faculties, me and your way so. But we just twist the question. We just twist the question on the choice. That is why you must do more and more MCQs. Very well, what's next? Which test is used for confirmation of the diagnosis on a fixed dilated pupil? So you have a patient with a fixed dilated pupil and is it a cocaine? Pilocarpine, apraclonidine, or swinging torchlight test. Okay, so we have these four tests which can be used in a fixed dilated pupil. First, let's look at that. So we have this pupil which is dilated like this, and this arm. This is not. It looks like this. So what could I do with this? Could I do a cocaine test? Now remember, cocaine test is used for diagnosis of Horner syndrome, but you cannot. You do not have a dilated pupil in Horner syndrome. You have a constricted pupil, is not. You have Horner syndrome. You have ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. So it cannot be the cocaine. Not that you could get taken the easy days anyway. Pilocarpine test, well, maybe. Apraclonidine test, a swinging torch. Swinging torch light test 
is not useful because this is used for an AD, a big part, it is used for a Marcus gun pupil, which is not. A Marcus gun pupil is not dilated. So the situation has to be naproxen and pilocarpine and the answer is pilocarpine test. Why? Because we are suspecting you have fixed dilation, this is normal, so this is the ADS pupil. Put a drop of pilocarpine and the normal pupil does not remain the same because it's too diluted. But this is that immediately constricts like this and this is the sign of denervation supersensitivity of AD's pupil, it is the pilocarpine 0.125 percent, which is important. Okay, in diagnosing this, this apricot test. Remember, there's another test which we use for Horner syndrome again. Okay, nowadays cocaine is difficult to get. You know, cocaine because of extremely high potential for addiction among amongst doctors, particularly amongst doctors. I must add, so we do not get cocaine. So we use apricot again for the Horner syndrome. But this is not Horner's, a fixed talent is usually means that we're thinking of a ADS pupil. It is the pilocarpine test, very well. What next? We have in paralytic squint. So this is paralytic squint, remember, is the primary deviation more than secondary? Is primary less than secondary? Is primary deviation equal to secondary? And is it none of the above? So again, so look at the question. In paralytic squint, so there is paralysis, either the third nerve, the fourth nerve or sixth nerve, okay, anything. What could the cause? Well, it could be vasculopathic like diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, okay, most common. What is primary? So first of all, before we know the answer, we must know primary division, secondary. Look at that. What is this? Suppose I have the right eye in a primary component. Suppose I have a right six nerve paralysis, okay. So right six nerve goes, that lateral lectus is paralyzed, the middle lectus forces the eyeball like this. So we have one eye looking straight at you, uh, squinting like this. Now this angle, okay, look at the primary division, remember, is the angle between the two eyes with the normal eye fixing, okay. So suppose my left eye is normal when I look at you, so the angle between the two eyes with the normal eye fixing is called primary deviation. That's simple, primary, normal eye. Secondary deviation means the angle between two eyes with the paralyzed eye fixing. What does that mean? It means that look, this is a normal. Now supposing I make an immense effort with the paralyzed eye, so I turn my gaze, I like this. An immense effort has to be required to move the paralyzed. So I move the paralytic gaze into the fixing gaze like this. But because of Herring's law, okay, remember as I put a tremendous amount of effort into the paralyzed eye, so this effort will also turn this eye. So as I move this eye into looking into the fixing gaze, this effort will be conveyed this and because there is so much more effort, so this will move a lot and the angle will change. Remember the secondary deviation is always more than the primary deviation in a paralytic squint which means the second primary is less than second division or second division is more than primary division in fact. So the answer is B as you can see it here. Look at that. So this eye is moved. So this is the angle between the two eyes. So this is a normal eye fixing, okay? The normal eye is looking at this, let's say. So this is a five degree. But now I move this eye. Just look, the second gaze. What has happened? This eye is making tremendous effort to move out to look at this. And this tremendous effort of this eye will also by Herring's law be conveyed to eye. So because this making so much effort, so this also moves more and because the effort is more here, so the angle is also more here. So second deviation always more than primary deviation in a paralytic squint, which means the second, the secondary is more than primary is correct. Remember in competent squint, the primary is equal to the second deviation. Please remember, in competent squint, this is true, primary is equal to second division, but in paralytic squint, second division is more than primary division, which you see here. So this is a very important question which you must memorize and understand, of course. And what is the most common variety of childhood strabismus? Again, this is why I mentioned in passing, and you might remember that, paralytic strabismus, incorrect, dear me, children don't have paralytic squints, thankfully. A common usotropia is the correct answer. A common usotropia it is, and intermittent exotropia is also common, but is not as much as this. And consecutive exotropia, what is consecutive? Consecutive means that after the treatment, it has become exo. You see, exo means outward. So it was eso before, and after surgery, it become exo. You understand? After post-surgery, if it turns from eso to exo, we call it consecutive. Or if, it could be vice versa also. It was exo before, but after surgery, it becomes more eso. Instead of becoming straight, You've done too much overcorrection and it's become more. So consecutive means it is gone from one to the opposite after surgery, excessive treatment. So the best answer, a common usotropia. This is the single most common type of squint in children, particularly after the age of two, 
where they developed esotropia because of uncorrected hypermetropia. This picture we've seen before. And this is because uncorrected hypermetropia, they are accommodating and converging. And we give them glasses, they become equal. This is the most common type of childhood squints, particularly after a certain age, which is about two years of age. Okay, so answer is here. And I, with that, I think we're almost finished now, and unless it is completely finished. And yes, that is correct. It is finished indeed. It is. Thank you so much for listening to me. Just let me see if I have any questions. If you have any questions, please ask me. I'm just going to look into my this thing and find out if you have any questions. And uh, I, I've got a message here remembering the Uzgorod cake, my dear. I have never forgotten it. Uzgorod cake, I dream about it. I lust after it. I have never forgotten. I will never forget it. Okay, I've got a message here. And we've got some uh, uh, questions. If you have any, please ask me now. But otherwise, I've got answer, a lot of answers, my friends. <coughs> I don't think I have any questions. But if you want any advice, last few words, I have nothing to advise. You accept that you must revise, 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 do as many MCQs as possible. I hope this little session has helped you. And may you all pass, may you all do well. But even if you don't do well, remember, it, uh, your efforts will always be. So please remember these last 20 days you have. Please do your best, put your best into it. You know, you, you can still pass in these 20 days, make the best of it. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you very much.